Well, good evening and welcome to Word Wednesday. I'm calming myself down because we have been trying to get on this Zoom for a few, few, few minutes. Um, but it's all good. The devil is a liar. We're not going to be defeated. I'm talking about lust tonight. So I was kind of expecting something to go wrong. We had to switch out computers. They couldn't get my camera on. But you know what? To God be the glory. Huh. We are here and we're going to have a wonderful lesson tonight. We're going to believe God that God is going to bless somebody. God is going to help somebody experience new growth in him. And he's going to help us all become better as we progress in being Christ-like. So thank you so much for joining me as we are continuing our series on the seven deadly sins. Uh, shout out to Bishop who started us off with greed. And then to Pastor Crystal last week who did a wonderful job with envy. And again, tonight we're talking about lust. Mm-hmm. And so we know that the enemy does not want us to proceed and he doesn't want us to grow and he doesn't want us to hear the word because as we hear the word then the, and hear the teachings that come through the word of God, we can become better. We can really, really present our bodies as living sacrifices and know that our bodies are really the temple of the Holy Spirit and he dwells within us and we want to perfect those uh, areas in our lives that may not be where God wants us to be or even where we want them to be. So thank you so much for joining me on tonight. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day that you've blessed us to see. And as the day begins to, to turn into evening, we thank you that it's been a good day and it's been a productive day. We give you praise and honor and glory in all things. We pray now that you will send the anointing upon us, upon me and upon those who are viewing and perhaps even those that are listening, that we may hear you clearly tonight and begin to work on areas in our lives that are not pleasing in your sight. We rebuke the hand of the enemy and we say all is going to be good. So have your way tonight, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's begin. Of course, we know that we're calling these the seven deadly sins, but there are other sins. This is not an exhaustive list of all that we have uh, to perfect ourselves in, but it's certainly these seven deadly sins are a starting point for us to begin to examine our lives, to look at the word of God, to look at the areas in our lives that are not pleasing to God, and then begin to work on them. And as we work on ourselves to, again, present our bodies acceptable unto the Lord, unto the Lord, we know that it's going to have to be intentional. No growth, no maturity, no perfecting in our life or lifestyles. It doesn't come erroneously. We have to make up our minds to be intentional in presenting ourselves to God. So again, this is not an exhaustive list. There are other things um, that we have to perfect other than these seven, what we call the seven deadly sins. There are other areas in our lives that we're going to have to continually grow toward growth and development so that we can be again Christ-like. I'm going to begin with uh, seven, um, and there are many, many biblical references as it relates to lust. I'm going to uh, begin with seven that I feel are, are, is, are very good in uh, helping us to begin our conversation with you tonight as it results around or evolves around lust. So the first one comes from John chapter 3, uh, verse 16, and uh, I'm sorry, this is 1st John chapter 2, verse 16. This is the English Standard um, Version. So this is 1st John chapter 2 and verse 16, and it says this, For all that is in the world, the desire of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride in possessions is not from the Father, but is from the world. It's seven of them. Here's number two. It comes from James chapter one, verses 14 and 15. And all of the scriptures that we're going to read together come from the English Standard Version. This says, but each person is tempted when he has lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. 
Scripture number three comes from Colossians chapter number three and verse number five. And it says this, put to death therefore what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. The next scripture is coming from Romans chapter number eight and verse number five. And it says this, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Hmm. But those who live according to the spirit set their mind on the things of the spirit. Okay, to, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. And that is Ephesians chapter number four and verse 22. And here's the next to the last one. And this again comes from John, first John chapter two, and this is verses 15 through 17. Again, this is first John chapter two, verses 15 through 17. And it says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, and we're gonna hear this again several times tonight, all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of possessions is not from the Father, but from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. And here's the last one. And it comes from Titus chapter number two, verse number 12. Titus chapter two, verse 12. And it says this, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly possessions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. I really like this one. I'm gonna repeat it. Titus 2, verse 12. Training us, train yourself to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled upright and godly lives in this present age. We want to dismiss ourselves from passions and possessions that will cause us not to live a godly life. This is where I really, really want you to focus in this present age or in this time or live godly right now. Okay, here are four statements that can begin to uh, shape our discussion even further tonight. Four statements concerning lust. Four statements concerning lust. Now, lust is not just a sexual immorality. You can lust over many things. You can lust over wealth, you can lust over uh, uh, another person's giftings, another person's talents. Love, lust is not just sexual immorality, although that is one of the basic things that causes us to miss out with God. We'll talk about that even deeper as we go into the presentation. So here are four statements concerning lust. Here's statement number one. Lust is a gastro sin like carbon monoxide silently expanding to fill any space it's given choking out life lust is a very very destructive sin and here's statement number two 
Lust begins, here's where, listen closely. Lust begins and often stays in one's mind or at least in one's private life. We struggle to confess it. Let me let me let me repeat that again. Lust begins and often stays in one's mind, or at least mm -hmm, in one's private life. We struggle to confess it, and the hiddenness of love, lust, hiding it, acting acting as if it doesn't exist. The hiddenness of lust amplifies its coercive effect on our souls, on our regard for others, for other people, and our capacity to love. Lust is dangerous. It alters how you see yourself, how you see yourself in regards to others, and thus causes you to put your desires above what may be good or right or righteous. Here's statement number three. These are statements concerning lust. In lust, we dehumanize other people simply because you're putting yourself and your desires above others. We dehumanize other people. We desire to use them. You use people when you lust. You use people for your own benefits. We seek to meet our own physical and emotional desires without regard for others. Lust places you in a posture when everything is about you. We place our desire, desires before another's personhood and worth. So you have no regard for another person. You simply are in it for yourself, whatever the in it is. And here's the last statement concerning lust. Here's what it says. Lust says more, more, more with no regard for anyone beyond your own self. I want more of what it is. I want more of whatever. I want more of this. I want more of that. It says more, more, more with no regard to anyone else, anyone else's feelings, anyone else's personal person it's all about you lust is it, it's 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 a sin that fuels itself and grows itself by disregarding others and lust does it at any cost to another person again it's selfish it's controlling it is horrible because you have no, no respect for another person. Here's another word for lust because we, we saw it in our scriptures uh, a lot. Okay. Another word for lust is desire. What one desires, your desires. And what is desire is to want something especially strongly, to want something especially strongly, to have a strong sexual attraction to someone. So lust is desire that causes you to want something so strongly, you will do anything to have it, anything to stay involved with it, it alters even your, your mind and your conduct to the fact that it's all about what you feel and what you want. It, it's, it's a dangerous desire. It is negative and it causes us to put everything about us 
what we like, what we want, how we want it, when we want it, and even to whom or who we get it from. It is a self-consuming spirit. It is demonic, it is devilish, and it is deadly. Here's some ways to combat lust. How can we, how can we, how can we build ourselves up so that we are no longer fulfilling our desires, our appetites for sexual immorality, our, our, our appetite for things that are not pleasing to God, our appetite to not to do those things, denying our flesh, causing our bodies to come under subjection to the word and the laws of God. So how, 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 can, we, how can we begin to combat lust? Here's the first thing. Acknowledge, acknowledge that this is not a good desire, that this feeling is not of God, this action is against God's law. You acknowledge it, you acknowledge lust when it comes knocking at your door. Don't overlook it, don't bypass it, don't, don't, don't act like it's not existing, and for goodness sakes, do not call it something else other than what it is. It is not love, it is lust. Acknowledge lust when it comes knocking. See and name how you're feeling, what you're thinking, and why? Why are you craving this? Why can't you let this go? Why can't you do what the word of God says when it talks about us becoming physically and emotionally self-controlled? Acknowledge it. Here's number two. Recognize. Hmm. What triggers these feelings? What triggers this desire? What triggers this appetite of lust? Is it a circumstance? Is it a person? Is it a time of day? You, you, again, you have to intentionally bring your body and those appetites that are worldly, that are natural and unnatural, you got to bring them under subjection. So you have to recognize after you acknowledge this, you act, after you acknowledge it, you have to recognize. What are your triggers? What are your triggers? It is a circumstance. <laughs> is it a person? Is it a time of day? Temptations tend uh, to run along certain lines. Find them and address them. You cannot tell me that you do not know as a Christian when you are tempted. You know it. Now you may not want to acknowledge it. You may not act, you, want, you may want to act like as if it doesn't exist. But the first way to combat it is to admit it, acknowledge it. Then recognize what are your triggers. Is it a song? Does that put you in a certain move? Is it a conversation? What? Number three, notice, pay attention. Because you want to combat lust. You want to bring lustful desires out of your inner self. Notice, notice what? Notice your thoughts and your physical state. What are you thinking about when these desires, these, these ungodly uh, actions, behaviors come up? What do, we mean? what do we mean by ungodly? Things that are against the word of God. Well, and, and notice, what is your physical state? What is your, what's your mind and body? They inform one another. Your mind and your body informs your physical state. Of course, 
cultivate activeness at attentiveness to both caring well for your soul for caring well for yourself and your soul you have to be conscious to say to yourself this is not right i'm noticing this uh, behavior i'm noticing this craving i get this desire when blank 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 number four find so you acknowledge you recognize you notice what's going on when these lustful desires appear so you find find what find two or three friends who you can be brutally honest with about the ways in which you are not the person you want to be you have to be brutally honest with yourself and then you have to find some accountability partners that you can be honest with and tell them what you're struggling with because you've acknowledged it, you've recognized it, you've noticed it. Now you have to have somebody who's going to also hold you into accountability and not fool with you and say, oh, everybody has something, everybody's struggling. So, okay, if everybody has something, everybody's struggling with something. We are overcomers. The Bible says we could overcome sin. We could overcome temptation. So you find yourself some accountability partners that you can be honest with. And remember that your problem won't surprise them that much. You know why? Because the people who love you really know where, where you're at. Now you can, what's the old cliche? Shay, you can fool some of the people, what? Some of the time, but you ain't fooling nobody. If people really know you, they also know some of your inner struggles. So you'll be surprised when you, when, when you confess it to them and ask them to bring you in check, to keep you in check, be accountable to them. They're not going to be that surprised. We are all facing our own demons. We all have things in our lives that we're trying to overcome. And as we overcome some things, then we overcome something else. If we've overcome greed, we have to overcome envy. If we overcome envy, now we have to overcome lustful desires. So it's normal to, to have to fight with your flesh. Jesus fought with his flesh in the temptation. Right there in Matthew, when the devils had turned the stones to bread. It wasn't that he wasn't hungry. He'd been fasting for 40 days. He was hungry. But what did he say? No. I'm going to bring my flesh under subjection. I will not live by food alone. So people struggle with different things. But when we are struggling with lust, it is so, so very damaging. Number five. Number five. Read and look. Read and look. You read and you look to the Bible as a guide. Not to what society is saying, because society will tell you to comply with those desires, comply with the lust, comply with what you want. After all, it's what you want, and you deserve to have what you want, because that is your desire. No. We are guided by the word of God. So five, we read, we look to the Bible as our guide. The Bible will help you know and understand God's word. It will help you know and understand God's word in a better way. It will make you eager to follow it. You can't want to do right, read the word of God, and you don't begin to work on what is wrong so that you can become right. You hear what I'm saying? 
You, you can't read the word of God and say, Lord, help me to transform my mind, transform my behavior in a way that is pleasing in your sight, that is not working against your word. You can't read and look and want to be a godly person, a godly person, a Christian in your behavior and conduct, and the Holy Spirit not help you. So you have to read and look and let the Bible again be your guide, not your friends. Not your groupies, not your clique, but your accountability partner who's going to say, uh uh, not today. You're not going to fall into that trap today because you've already acknowledged it, recognized it. <laughs> You're not going to do that. A strong accountability partner. And here's the last one receive grace. And, and I thought this was so key because as we look at ourselves, as we begin to grow and develop and begin to purge ourselves from these deadly sins, we have to receive grace. We have to know that, that, that grace as you receive grace as you face and admit your sin. And we have to call it what it is. It's not a mistake. It's not, oh, just that's just my way. It's not just your way. It's a sin. These are called the seven deadly sins, not the seven deadly mistakes. These are sin. And the Bible teaches us that sin should not reign in our mortal bodies. Okay, so you have to admit it. Know that God will give you grace and that many others bear the same load. Maybe not the same sin, but we all have None of us are perfect. The Bible says all of us then come short of the glory of God. So all of us are working on something. But I repeat, lust is dangerous. It is demonic and it is deadly because it makes you comply to your flesh. It makes you give in to desires that are not like God. Here's what lust is really about. It's about your conscience versus your conduct. As you read and look at the word of God, it's going to give you a conscience. It's going to tell you this is wrong. This is not right. This is not the way God wants you to act. This is not the behavior God wants you to produce. When you read and look and follow God's word, it gives you a conscience. And a conscience is a feeling that you know you should, a feeling that you know and should do what is right, what is good, what is perfect. It's a feeling that you know that you should do what is right and you should avoid doing what is wrong. There should be a, another word to go with conscience is conviction. There should be some conviction when you're doing things you don't have no business doing. There should be some conviction there because you have a conscience. You should know that it's wrong. You should feel bad. And it should make you feel guilty when you've done something that you know is wrong. How do you persist in a behavior that you know is wrong? When you've read in God's word that it's wrong. I'm not talking about something somebody made up. When you have read in God's word that it is wrong, that we are to divorce ourselves from earthly desires, from lustful ways, from lustful attitudes, from lustful behavior. How do you continue in sin? Paul said, God forbid. You need a conscience. And what does a conscience do? It helps you with your conduct. It helps you with your behavior. And here's what, here's what conduct means. Conduct, to behave in a particular way, especially in public or formal situations, or to organize the way in which you live in a particular way. Your conduct should reflect your conscience, and your conduct is should be godly. It should be Christ-like. The Bible tells us to put away youthful lust, and then to go on to perfect to perfect ourselves according to the Word of God. 
These are ways to combat lust. To bring yourself into a posture or position where that desire no longer overtakes you. That desire no longer controls you. Okay, scriptures to wage war against lust. Scriptures look at my time, to wage war against lust. Okay, here's the first scripture. And I'm basing the whole presentation on the word of God so that even after this particular teaching is over, you can go back because you're going to be faced with everything that you've heard tonight. Scriptures that wage war, that helps you combat and wage war against us. James 4 and 7, this is the King James Version. It says here, submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, resist the desire, and the devil will flee from you. The, des the desire will flee. The desire will flee from you. So, 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 when, you, when we wage war against lust, we have to flee. And, and to, to flee means to escape by running. You have to run from it in your inner being, in your mind, in your emotion, in your physicalness. You have to flee. You have to run from lust. Resist it. Resist it. Don't submit to it. Resist it. The second thing, you have to fight. And here's the, here's, here's, you have to flee. Here, here's the scripture for fight. And it comes from Romans and it's verses seven, chapter 7, verses 19 through 20. It's Romans chapter 7, verses 19 through 20. Here's what it says in the Holman Christian Bible. It says this, for I do not do the good that I want to do. But I practice the evil that I do not want to do. Now, if I do what I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it. But the sin, the desire, that lust that lies within me. I'm going to read that again. You have to fight. What do you have? The, 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 the original King James version said uh, uh says it um i'm um, like this for there's a war going on inside of me when i would do good evil is present but here's here, here's the home in translation for i do not do the good that i want to do my conscience my conduct i know this is not this is not this is not right i'm fighting I do not do the good that I want to do but I practice the evil that I don't want to do because my conscience is telling me this is wrong. This is lustful. This is my own selfish desire. How? Now, if I do what I do not want, hmm, I am no longer the one doing it. But the sin, that desire, that lust is overtaking me and I am doing it because something is living within me that is not of God. So I discovered this principle. When I want to do what is good, evil is with me. For in my inner self, lust is an inward thing. For my inner self, I joyfully agree with God's law. My, my conscience is telling me that, 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 that God's law is what I need to find strength and joy in, not that inner evil desire. Because I know, I, it starts, I know what I'm doing is wrong. So I, I, I do not do the good that I want to do. I do evil. Evil is always present. The war is inside of me. So we go back to, to the first one, flee, resist, fight to live a godly, lust-free life. Here's the next one. So you flee, you fight, and that causes you to build a foundation. And that is found in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19. And it says this. This is Holman Christian Standard Bible. Nevertheless, 
God's solid foundation stands firm, having this inscription. The Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who names the name of the Lord must turn away from unrighteousness, must turn away from desires that are not godly, must turn away from lust. So it helps us to build a foundation that helps us to be strong at our base. Your base is your conduct. Your base is what God has called all of us to be. So when we fight our inner desires, our inner lustful appetites, and when we flee from them and resist them, then our foundation becomes sure. And we can build our lifestyles, our conduct, and our behavior according to that foundation. Know this, that the foundation of the Lord standeth sure. He knows them that are his. And he expects us to live a life free from lust. Free from personal desires that are against the word of God. We're, 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 not, we're not talking about what, what society says. We're not talking about what society has accepted. We're not talking about what politics and politicians have to say. We govern ourselves as Christians by the laws of God. The laws of God that are in God's word. And we cannot isolate one law and say, I'm going to do this, but I'm not going to do that. You can't isolate a part of the word of God that you don't like and say, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do this. All of the word of God is right. Every command that he's given us about how we should live, he expects us to live that way. And it does not matter what that lustful desire is. We have to overcome it. I repeat, it is not all sexual. You can lust after many things. But because the sexual part of lust is what we hear most, my last few moments, I'm going to talk about eight ways to tell the difference between love and lust. Because if you don't know what lust is, then you also don't know what love is. So eight ways to tell the difference between love and lust. Here's the first way. Ask yourself, why are you interested in this relationship? Why are you interested in the relationship? Lust. <laughs> alone is interested only in the partner's sexual. He only, the lust is only interested in the relationship because of some sexual desire. Love is interested in getting to know the person over time. Lust is back to that more, 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 me, 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 mine, 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 mine. So if you want to know the difference between love and lust, why are you interested in the relationship? Zone for your own self desire, for your own sexual pleasure? Or are you in it for the long haul? Here's the second one. Are you open to do the hard work? So, the difference between lust and love or love and lust, ask yourself are, 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 are you open to do the hard work? Love is different from lust. Lust says this lust attempts to keep the relationship on an ideal level. Every relationship is going to have ins and outs, ups and downs, victories and failures, successes and no success. That's every relationship. But are you willing to do the hard work? Are you willing to stay in the relationship and do the hard work? Or does, or, or, or that, that, or lust doesn't want to do that. Love expands to having difficult 
conversation and explores painful emotions. Okay, let me hasten. Number three, how do you feel about the person's flaws? And we're going to post all this so you can get it. So that's number three. How do you feel about the person's flaws? That's important. Love loses, lust loses interest and doesn't, doesn't want to be bothered with the person's flaws. Love accepts a person's positive and negative qualities. Number four, does a relationship get better over time? This is how to tell the difference between lust and love. Does a relationship get better over time? Lust, about, lust is about immediate gratification, my immediate desire, my immediate sexual desires, my immediate sexual pleasure. Love develops trust and commitment and all those things that make love strong. Number five, where's the thrill coming from? Where's the thrill in this relation coming from? Lust enjoys fantasies and excitement and all that kind of interaction. Love feels and it's risky and it's vulnerable because it involves opening yourself up and letting yourself be known to and by another person. Okay, here's number six. How secure do you feel in the relationship? There's a difference between lust and love. You can ask yourself these questions, married or single. Lust can be impulsive, impulsive and desperate. I got to have you. I got to see you now, now, now. It's me, me, me. You feel my desire. Feel my wants. Feel me, me, me. Love tends to be steady and secure. These are ways how to tell the difference between lust and love. Number seven. Do you feel obsessed with the person? Are you obsessed? Lust is high that cannot be, it's like an addiction. It can't be controlled. It's cons you're consumed by it. You think about the person. You got to be with the person. You got to have the person. Blah, 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 blah. It's lust. Love is not like that. Love finds a more balanced perspective. Okay? You're not going to be upset. Okay. And here's the last one. Is there longevity in the relationship? Are you in it for longevity? Love dissip lust dissipates over time. Love is persistent. It persists. So when we look at lust, we can see all of those things that are not pleasing to God and things that we have to work on, things that we have to overcome, things that we have to become better in and out. Here's my final scripture, and I'm going to pray. Here's my final scripture. We've talked about scriptures in the beginning that describe us. We've talked about statements concerning lust. We've talked about ways to combat lust. We talked about how we can secure ourselves, bring our bodies under subjection. We talked about conscience and conduct. We talked about lust and desire. So here, here's my final scripture before we pray. It comes from Philippians. Chapter 4. Some of you may be familiar with it. In verse 8. This is the English Standard Version. It says this. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence. If there's anything worthy to be praised, think about these things. You overcome lust by leaning solely on the word of God, bringing your body under subjection, knowing that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit does not dwell in any unclean vessel, temple body. 
Let's pray. Father, we thank you for bringing us to a place of realization and causing us to look at ourselves inside out. We declare that within us there's really no good thing, but your grace and your mercy, it causes us to be, to be better in our lifestyles, our conduct, and our behavior. We want to live a righteous life. Lord, we want to be a Christian. Tell us what we have to do. How do we have to say? How do we have to walk? Help us to rid ourselves of sin. We're fleeing from it. We're fighting ourselves against those things that are not pleasing in your sight. We're building a firm foundation finally help us to think on things that will bring us into a place of growth, maturity, and a godly lifestyle. Help us, Holy Spirit, to look past our gifts and talents and abilities, struggle with ourselves, that we may become righteous in your sight. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I trust tonight that I've provoked some areas of thought as it relates to this deadly sin of lust. But as we strive to be better in our Christian lifestyle and relationship with God, we we'll work on our inner selves so that our outer selves will reflect not the character. God bless you. Thanks for joining. Good night.